The, uh, another village that was at the west end of Skidigan Inlet, Chalk Village, and I should mention that these uh, cartouches were ones that Bill Reed uh, did for the, uh, the book that I did on these villages, uh, Hide a Monumental Art. And uh, so he was commissioned by UBC Press to, to do the, the plates for them. And I was delighted that, uh, that Bill did some wonderful artwork for those. Um, the, the next one is Kaisun, which is over here on the west coast which was also called Gold Harbor. And that's where the California Gold Rush people, after the Gold Rush was over in California in 1851 and 52, uh, they headed north hearing there was gold up on the coast of British Columbia in 1858, of course, along the Fraser River. So uh, there was quite a gold rush for a couple of years until Albert Edward Eden Shaw uh, and uh, headed them off at the pass, so to speak, and uh, he and the chiefs of Skidigat burned the, the, the uh, ships of the California miners who were coming up. So that was enough to discourage any further visits from the miners. Now this is the uh, uh, village of Chatl, and it's on a series of rocky eminences and this pole, which is still standing, it's one of the few in fairly good condition, uh, and it belonged to Solomon Wilson, and now to the Wilson family. And it was protected in the trees, so it, uh, it didn't deteriorate as rapidly as most others, and it never fell over. Uh, in that same village, there are these two figures in the woods, and these are the mandas that I was pointing out were the burial boxes of the chiefs in a certain stage of their reincarnating uh, cycle uh, would be placed on the backs of these figures and then after the figures were brought out of the burial houses and put on the property lines of the different uh, uh, villagers. So one appears to be a bear, another appears to be a wolf. But there aren't too many of those uh, left. There's Bill's crest, the wolf, for the uh, village of uh, Kai Sun, which uh, is there on the west coast, I pointed out earlier. And it is uh, quite a sizable village. Um, certainly for a while, there was some wealth coming in from the miners, but there was more going out and the Haida quickly determined that was not a good exchange. But there again is the pattern of the houses. And each one of these clusters generally relates to family groupings. So the maps really tell the social history of these villages. And um, you can see rather unusual pattern of horn-like uh, figures uh, here, and also a house over here with the totem pole broken off. And the story is that the missionaries asked the uh, owners of the houses, the chiefs, to pull down their totem poles. So one of them chopped the top off his totem pole as a, a gesture, but none of them tore them down at that time. There you can see a little closer uh, the half totem pole here, and you can also see this uh, quite unusual motif like mountain goat horns uh, on that pole. And you can see a ladder going up here, notched ladder that would be typical of what was on the houses. There's a close-up of the beaver, uh, memora, uh, beaver at the base of the house that lost the, the top of the house. This was a settee that was in one of the houses that had become, has become quite notable since because Bill Holm uh, has identified this uh, as the work of an artist of which there are many other pieces in museum collections. So until recently, uh, the artist was only known as the master of the Chicago settee, which is very much like the Greek painters of uh, pottery being named, uh, you know, the Euphronius vase pot painter or whatever. But Robin Wright has uh, recently found uh, identification of who that uh, artist was, so we're one step closer to knowing something of the history. Uh, of, uh, of that artist. He carved a lot in argillite, and uh, he carved uh, uh, large uh, totem poles in the, in the village of Tanu as well. 
So those are just some of the views of uh, the village. I think even though this is a very remote village, way out on the west coast, it shows the feature of the Haida, which has always attracted a lot of attention, that probably of any group in the uh, Aboriginal world, they had the most elaborate villages, that every house had a major display of monumental art in front of the house. And I've searched for 40 years to see if I could find you know, anything in New Guinea or you know, photographs of other uh, places in the world that, uh, that produced a lot of art. And I certainly have never found you know, anything as uh, uh, not just flamboyant, but as satisfying as the art of the Haida and these uh, wonderful carvings that tell the lineage histories. Now, when you go to the village sites today, this is more what you're likely to find. Actually, this is now in, in uh, 1969 when Adelaide de Manil did a photographic reconnaissance of the coast and uh, took more than 20,000 photographs of all of the villages and poles. So again, it's a wonderful benchmark. There were three or four different photographers, Maynard I mentioned, uh, Charles Newcomb, another one, um, and, uh, and Adelaide de Manil, um, and uh, George Emmons in other parts of the coast, that uh, you know, we're, we really owe them a debt of gratitude for having preserved all of this material. Again, just a reference to Bill, and uh, I don't have a book plate for that particular village on my computer, so I just put that one on. But uh, that's uh, the um, village of uh, Skadan, so we are from Kumshawa, sorry. And so this is what the village looked like in 1878. And you can see a lot of the monuments have been fairly recently put up, like this one, for instance, because the paint did not last on those uh, exposed pieces of wood for more than about four years, four or five years, because you know they weren't enamels, they were uh, pigments uh, mixed with fish oil, but they did have a tendency to, to wash off. As you can see here, this one on the left was carved, and then it would also have been painted, but the paint has now disappeared. But you can see it's very deep carving, very distinctive uh, figures. There's a closer picture of that painted mortuary. So I would say that, that with a, probably within two years that had been put up before. And you very often see coppers on the poles, and not unlike uh, the one Jim has put on this pole of memorials. Again, uh, the, sometimes like that one we have in the window upstairs, the uh, bear plaque, uh, they would have paintings on the side and then eventually those paintings disappeared and it looked like there was just a head in the center of the mortuary plaque. And these figures generally re represent whales with this large uh, downturn beak. Uh, human figures are not all that common in Haida carving. So this one uh, could be human or it might even be a, a supernatural snag which often took human form, but it's a particularly uh, attractive carving, I think, and quite a new one when that picture was taken. So you can see there were a lot of houses in this uh, village. Uh, that's a more archaic style, the way the figures are carved on there. And you do find poles that are suggestive of having been carved more around 1800 than 1850 because of archaic styles that you can detect in, in some of the uh, North Coast villages in particular. Here you can see in the background, the uh, peering through the open work of the house, the mortuary houses. And there's even one back there you can just make out, which has a peaked roof. And that was another feature for the coffins of the deceased. I rather like the uh, the details of the carvings on that uh, house. And you can see as well that there were gardens uh, appearing, little fences to fence them off. Again, here, here are some of the mortuary houses 
in the back of the village. Only the very high-ranking people, but very often uh, the wives of ranking chiefs were in these uh, mortuaries uh, with the big plaques on the front. You can see the smoke hole cover there, with timber drying on the side of the house. And, and at this stage, uh, European-style ladders have come in, and very often you'll see both types on the side of the house. And then slowly the villages begin to deteriorate. So people generally who were visiting thought, oh, this village is abandoned. But of course, they were, they were never, and in most cases now, are still not abandoned from the point of view of seasonal use. That they're still very important in the economic cycle. People go back to the villages and they may camp or they may, you know, have uh, little structures like this one here is where someone has built a seasonal camp after the big houses have uh, been uh, torn down or partially torn down. And that's when the museums moved in. So here's a party from the American Museum of Natural History uh, at the village of Kumshoa. Here is the uh, pole they're about to cart off to New York and it now is in 12 foot sections in the Northwest Coast Hall of the American Museum of Natural History. And there were many other uh, poles from these villages that were uh, likewise uh, removed. This is the one that's in New York, this tall one here, before it came down. And here's one in the uh, process of being removed, being lowered. So it's amazing the photography uh, captures a lot of this. This is a uh, mortuary house. You can see it's very small, but it has its own frontal pole. And it stood behind the other big houses. You'll see examples in the model around the corner of uh, that type of mortuary house. This is one that was collected from Kumshua and taken to the Field Museum. So it's still there. It was there for the Chicago World Fair of 1893. And uh, the, um, these houses were filled with carved boxes like this one. This is a chief's coffin that again were taken without permission uh, from the various village sites and worked their way into museum collections. And moving on to Skadan's village, which is over on the Hecate Strait side, right there. It's on, the, it's on the mainland, not on the island there. And this is a painting uh, by Gordon Miller uh, of the village of Skadan's based on the photograph that Dawson took uh, back in the uh, 1880s. Um, so he has, as in all of his paintings, uh, very accurate architectural renderings. Uh, this one you saw a little earlier, at least in part, uh, with the, uh, the wonderful carvings, both on the mask-like panel on the frontal pole and on the, the mortuary box. Another view of uh, one of the houses next to the house of the chief of Skadans. And here you see how it's curving around the beach. That was one of the larger villages. Again, these houses all have wonderful names. I haven't labeled them all on that uh, slide. But they are available in Swanton's uh, ethnography of the Haida. At the back, he has lists of the different houses. Here you see a Amanda, a bear, that would have been from a funeral of a chief, and a number of mortuary posts, as well as the house frontal poles. And um, there's someone sitting <laughs> irreverently uh, on that uh, funeral bier, or whatever you wish to call the uh, figures that were there. Now. Again, going there today, uh, there are just fragments of these uh, buildings remaining, and the corner posts and so on are, are there, but uh, the poles have primarily disappeared. Tanu, which is uh, moving even further south, this is the last one before we 
look at uh, Skungwai, which is down at the south end. Tenu is a wonderful village. There it is in 1878, still thriving. Uh, the chief has just died. That's his house here. And we'll see as you blow up these photos, well, here's the chief's house, this one, number five. And, but there are actually two, two village groups coalesce, so you can almost see that in the pattern of the village here. And so that's the, the uh, south end of the village, and then next to it is this house. Um, and in front of the house, you can see a whole series of boxes tied with lids tied on, and then a group of, uh, of men, primarily, would appear, uh, sitting here and over on the other side. And they are actually Simpson, who have come for a big uh, funeral feast. And George Mercer Dawson records this in detail. It was July the 10th, 1878, when this uh, feast took place. And <laughs> here, I put this one in for Jim. Uh, here is the artist, the carver, carving the last of the pole that is going to replace this pole. So the guests have arrived, and the, the new pole hasn't gone up yet. <laughs> Sorry, Jim. <laughs> uh, a tremendous uh, memorial here to a, a chief with a, a sea lion helmet inlaid with abalone. I mean, that's about as elaborate as it all, as it all gets. Now that's the new one that you saw being carved on the beach, this, this one here. And again, it has the flood story. And basically the story is that when the great flood comes, this uh, chief has a hat with so many rings on the hat that that's the highest thing in the area that the villagers can save themselves on. So they climb up the hat until the waters have receded. So you can see this uh, figure of a chief at the bottom has an extremely high hat with a bird perched up on the top of it. There's a close-up of the house. It's, uh, again, uh, interesting with the kind of crown of frogs that he has over his head and down the sides, which is similar to the pole of Chief uh, Skittigat. Um, and then all the, you can now see those boxes, dozens of boxes, several rows of boxes that are, uh, are part of what the Simpson have brought in trade. So they would be invited to the funeral feast, but they would take advantage of the occasion to have a big trading party as well. So they would be bringing over the mountain goat wool and, and mountain goat horn and sheep uh, wool and all the things that don't occur over on Haida Gwaii. So in, in some ways, the more I look at the activities that were happening in these villages, the more it's sort of on the level of the Hanseatic League, that is major trading partnerships between the chiefs and the owners of these houses. And it helps to explain these big, you know, war canoes that weren't always at war. They were also freighting goods back and forth to the villages and capable of carrying several tons at a time in these huge dugout canoes. So I think it's one element that's been very much underestimated is the commerce that, had, that was going on at the same time as the feasting and other activities that people read about. Here's a, a bit of a closer view of that wonderful uh, sea lion helmet. And you can see there's sea lion fins coming down, but a human face in between. And you can see the abalone that is there. And that's very similar to some of the real war helmets of the Haida that have been preserved in collections. Uh, this looks like a little mouse. Bill was always saying uh, he could never find an image of mouse woman, and I doubt if that's it, but it always reminds me of that when I, uh, when I see this little face up here. Again, you can see that that has only been up for a year or two when this photograph is taken, and pretty well the same for some of the other poles over here. So you begin to realize that there's a uh, real chronology of poles in these photographs that some of them are relatively new when the pictures are taken, and we know in every case when that was, but some of them could be as much as 100 years old if they're well protected uh, by uh, vegetation rather than uh, falling over and rotting. Again, here's the, uh, the chief 
Gitkun, his name was, means southeast wind in Haida. And they're the little people. You can just make them out on the uh, cylinders. And there is that uh, one of those painted faces. This is a, p a picture about 20 years later. So by that time, the paint has disappeared. Here is an early version of the weeping woman motif, or julicons, that probably is, uh, on the height of poles. And here is a later one, you can see again. And this pole is now in the Provincial Museum in Victoria and considered to be one of the, the real uh, treasures of, of Haida pole carving. But again, you can see that there's monuments galore as you go around the corner in this village. Here's a closer version, and the reason that it probably is Jolicon's is the, the frog here and the story of the volcano and so on. I won't get into the mythology because I've got too many slides and I'll be here for hours if I do. Uh, but again, here are poles that made it to different places. This one here is now in the Royal Ontario Museum. And uh, there it is again here in the foreground. Here is Emily Carr with her easel painting this house. And that pole went to Prince Rupert and then was transported back to Victoria and then up to Haida Gwaii and it was one of the casualties in the fire up in Haida Gwaii. And here I've, I've put two views of the same pole. I, I tend not to do that because that's what Marius Barbeau did in his books on totem poles and people have been confused ever since as to you know, what was standing where because of the superimposed pictures. This is the one Emily Carr was painting over on the right. And this is an extremely elaborate one here with a copper and a bird and a mortuary plaque and so on. Yeah, and that's the Royal Ontario one in the back. There it is again to the right in this picture. So there's lots of uh, photographs and what we can do now is scan those and actually uh, create wraparounds so that literally you can create an image of a full three-dimensional pole in the round, not just flat. So more and more we're looking at doing three-dimensional imaging. This is a rainbow woman with a hair that would have been painted brightly like a rainbow. And uh, this is one of the ones that uh, Bill and others uh, helped to remove from Tanu village. Uh, this pole is now in the Museum of Anthropology and you've all seen it. There it is in three sections on a pedestal. And then this one is, is, I think, my favorite in terms of the, the uh, carving of the face of that bear. This is a wonderful mortuary house frame that is now in the British Museum in London. They didn't, uh, the, the two um, wolf heads or whatever they are there, uh, are in the Royal BC Museum, so they didn't go together. But this pole is very prominently displayed at the, uh, at the British Museum. Saw it there recently. And uh, that's uh, Rufus Moody, and, or, and uh, Moody is his last name. I, I'll have to, and uh, uh, Newcomb, Charles Newcomb, uh, at the site of uh, recording the names of the houses. And this was the house pit of Chief Gitkong, a very, uh, large house that was well described by early travelers. And now we're back at the, the Mecca of it all for many people. Most, how many in this room have been to Skung Wai? Good number. I, I, this is the old label that was from the book of, of uh, an instance, but it's preferably to call it Skung Wai here. Actually, the map labels it both ways, but you can see it's right down at the very southern tip. A lot of these villages appear to have been strategically placed for the beginning of the early maritime fur trade because they could keep track of the ships going by. They could be right there with the trade goods. Again, it sort of fits you know, with my belief that these were big time traders. 
And that is also shown as soon as the sea otter have disappeared, the Haida come up with argillite carving. And it becomes a major part of commerce. So they're still able to get access to the metal and the trade goods, but uh, they created a totally new product for the marketplace within five years of the collapse of the sea otter uh, industry, then the argillite was in a big industry in its own right. Here is the village with the village chief's house. Um, Gordon Miller did a model uh, based on some of these maps and then did a series of paintings and we worked together on a, uh, quite a number of uh, reconstruction paintings of Haida villages. That's Skungwai. There is one that uh, I had him do when I had a year sabbatical at the Museum of Anthropology. So it's quite a large painting and it's actually there at it, it, UBC in the Museum of Anthropology. But it's uh, very accurate as to where all the uh, houses were. And he built this three-dimensional model so he could rotate it and always get the houses and the poles in the right relationship. Uh, another one of his paintings uh, that he did for the Canadian Museum of Civilization of Skung Wai Village. And of course, there were many uh, very dramatic episodes, like when the Lady Washington uh, came up and uh, uh, actually beat Koya for having uh, taken some laundry off the... So this was actually, this was uh, the second one, that uh, the trip when the Haida got their revenge and they captured the ship, the Lady Washington, and uh, burned it to the water line. This idea of doing reconstructions, this is one that uh, I worked on with people at the National Research Council who had some wonderful three-dimensional modeling uh, devices. These were poles in the uh, Museum of Civilization and a, a uh, screen from the Haida village of Klinkwan, which is up in Alaska, and also a Haida figure from a smoke hole. So we sort of put them all together, and these were designs that belonged to the chief of uh, Skung Wai and are there in the Royal BC Museum. And in fact, in the digital model, and I wish I could show it to you here, but you can actually open these boxes and take objects that have been collected for various museums out of the boxes in virtual space. And that was done 20 years ago. So the photographs give us uh, great detail. Uh, they look similar to a lot of the others until you get right down to the, the detail of the art and the carving and the uh, features. The, uh, the Bella Bella came and burned the end, one end of Skungwai village. So you can see there, it wasn't long after they burned that part of the village that uh, the, um, the photograph was taken. This is the little island off on the right, and it's dry in between. At this point, the picture's taken, but it's normally full of water when the tide's in. But these were taken in 1901. These are the first photographs taken of Skung Wai. And they were done by uh, Dr. Newcomb, Charles F. Newcomb. And again, you know, it's, it's just a delight to look at all the tiny little figures and carvings. But unlike the Simpson poles, which are primarily human figures, very large human figures on the poles, the Haida are always emerging from orifices or portions of the uh, crest figures or the crest animals. There's a row of uh, mortuary and memorial poles. And Gordon's attempt to animate that somewhat with uh, so what it would have been like when people were still living there. This was the last chief uh, Ninstance, is the name of the chief was Ninstance, um, to uh, uh, John Robson to live in the village and uh, was part of the departure. This is a photograph, it's kind of blurry and it's the colors deteriorated somewhat, but it was taken in 1957 when they began the uh, program to salvage poles from Skungwai, and it was taken by uh, Henry Hawthorne. 
And another one, again, not, not great color today, but showing that uh, wondrous uh, feature when the sun rises at Skung Wai Village, you, it suddenly illuminates all these figures. It's sort of reminiscent of the uh, tombs of the pharaohs when that happens. When Bill got there with the party of uh, people who were bringing the poles back to UBC and elsewhere, this is what they found lying on the ground. Most of this pole is now at UBC, but it's really just half a pole. It was lying the other way, and the top half had rotted off, and they turned it over and decided to uh, salvage what they could. So that's Wilson Duff on the right, and uh, Bill uh, Reed uh, helping to, to lower some of the poles. Again, Wilson on the left and Bill on the right with the pole from the interior of uh, one of the houses. Um, these were pictures when I first went there. This is more or less what was still to be seen. And if you go today, this is essentially the view you will have. There's still pieces of the poles there. Uh, how much longer they're going to last is a very interesting question. But uh, Parks Canada have done a lot, as have the Haida Watchmen, to ensure that the, the visitation continues as long as possible. And meanwhile, we have been working on a digital model. This is a still frame from it, but uh, it's mainly just to show the location of the pieces in three dimensions. So that can be done, again, that was done 30 years ago. So I hope I haven't run too far over time. Was Dan keeping track? <laughs> he said I'd never get through that many slides. 